Good evening. Welcome to Truth Seekers. I'm Mike Fishkin. Seated next to me is Jay Saylor. And um, we are live on April 10th, 2010. Uh, and we're going to continue tonight with where we left off two weeks ago uh, with this PhD in uh, the area of geology, uh, Terry Mortensen. Uh, and taking a look at Noah's Flood and the ramifications relating to Noah's Flood. Um, and we, we saw some very interesting things. Last time we saw some quotes from some, a scientist who died recently who said that, don't quote me on this, you know, it's in his book, but he didn't want any creationists quoting him on it, that, uh, that it was basically brainwashing that the field of geology is just rampant with people believing that everything happened gradually and that there weren't no major catastrophes on the planet that changed the geology. And he said, I don't want any creationist quoting me on this, but of course he's passed away. He knows the truth now. And, um, and how can you write in a book and say, don't quote me on this if you have a different opinion? It's kind of bizarre. In any case, um, we're live. You guys can call again if it's April 10th. We are about truth-seeking, philosophical and spiritual truth-seeking. We think that the answer resides in terms of who we are, where we're going, why we're here. It all resides around Jesus Christ and who He is. And we think the evidence for God's existence is clearly proven in a number of ways. One of the most clearly, DNA. And in terms of Jesus being the only way to God, that that's proven through 100% fulfilled prophecy in the Bible is probably the clearest way there. To, to see that. For those who are objective, I wasn't objective until I was searching for truth, until I was in my late 20s and Jay in his 30s. And when we really wanted truth, God was good for his promise. He said, you know, if you seek me with all your heart, you're going to find me. Mm. And that's what happened. That's where it starts, right there in your heart. It's just a simple question. Who are you? Are you really <laughs> the God of creation? And it's, it's amazing what the things he shows you when, you when you ask from your heart. I'd like to remind the viewers, Mike, that if, if they're interested in really seeking in the study of geology, uh, we did programs, I don't know, two, three years ago. Uh, it's a great film on, um, on strata layering, scientifically uh, um, how, how the strata is layered, and it'll truly open you up to... Um, the, the false teachings out there about the, the geological strata, the, the column um, that we're, we're taught about in schools. It's like, it's completely opposite of what we've been taught. We're going to see some of that, a little bit of that, uh, not quite exactly what you're talking about, but some of that tonight. You haven't seen this film yet. but Right, but I, I just wanted the viewers to know if, 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 if they're interested, you know, that, that stuff is out there, that evidence is out there. They don't have to take our word for it or this guy's word for it. Um, um, you can get a hold of uh, University, uh, what, the one in Fort Collins. Colorado, Colorado State. Colorado State University in Fort Collins. And, and they have this huge machine that layers strata. And I, I suppose just, you know, Google them up and, and you could probably get some really good evidence of Maybe. the scientists up there. Maybe. I haven't tried that. It just shows how that it's laid down through massive force of rushing water. Different layers kind of filter out in a... Uh, different sediment, it's rock size, the larger rocks is in one place and smaller rocks in another place. And, and interesting in that, Mike, though, also is with wind, a, a catastrophic wind, the same layering pattern happens with, with the, the same type of sediment. And, and I found that to be incredible. So there, we can see that it, it, it only happens in two ways, but it has to be a catastrophic event. Right, right. Um, we're going to show this first section of film, which is six and a half minutes long. And uh, then you can have an opportunity to give us a call if you'd like. And so we're just going to jump into that first section of film, six and a half minutes long, and we will see you in about six and a half minutes. We think. Let me illustrate. What's missing in this picture? What was it originally? I'll give you a moment to think about that. And then we'll have a little quiz, okay? Was the original picture A? Anybody want to vote for A? Okay? 
How about B? Was that what it, the picture was originally? C? Anybody want to vote for that one? Okay. This is what most of you will probably vote for, as uh, my past experience would suggest. Was that it? Yeah. Nope. The answer is nothing is missing. It was drawn that way. Now what happened? I brainwashed you. I brainwashed you by asking a simple question. What's missing? And what I did was I influenced your mind to think something is missing. I got to figure out what's missing because you asked the question. I brainwashed you. I got you to think the way I wanted you to think. So, we all have the same facts. The evolutionists and the creationist geologists, they have the same Grand Canyon, they have the same fossils, they have the same rock formations, but depending on the starting assumptions will affect not only what you see, but how you interpret what you see. So, Dr. Eger is saying, I was brainwashed with uniformitarian view, set of assumptions, slow gradual processes, no catastrophes in earth history of regional or global magnitude. And so when I went out and looked at the rocks, I couldn't see any evidence of catastrophe. But it was more and more observations of the real world that began to show him that the assumptions were wrong. And so he says, if you, if you go out without ruling out, a regional or global catastrophe, before you ever look at the evidence, you'll actually see the evidence. Now, these kinds of geologists are called neo-catastrophists. Neo for, from Latin for new. And uh, they are going back to some of the ideas of the early 19th century catastrophists. Now, the neo-catastrophists are still evolutionists. They still believe in millions of years. So they say, you know, if you look at that bottom layer there, let's say that shale, and if you don't look at it with uniformitarian assumptions, you will see evidence in that rock formation that it was formed catastrophically, rapidly. And then if you look at this next layer, let's say it's sandstone, and you look at it without uniformitarian assumptions, without ruling out catastrophe on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a very high level, before you ever look at the rocks, you'll actually see evidence in the rock layers that they were laid down catastrophically, rapidly. And if you look at the next layer, the same will be the case. And so they see this evidence of catastrophe. Dr. Ager said that much of the geological record shows evidence of catastrophic formation, but he still believes in the millions of years. So where do they put the time? In between the layers, where there is no evidence. That's convenient. <laughs> now the creationist geologists come along and say, now you neocatastrophists are on the right track. There is evidence in those layers that they were formed catastrophically and rapidly. But if you didn't start, you neocatastrophists, if you didn't start with the, with the anti-biblical assumption that ruled out a global flood before you ever started to look at the evidence, and if you looked more carefully at that boundary, you would see that there's no evidence of long passages of millions or thousands of years. There's evidence that this was laid down rapid in rapid succession. Let me give you just one example. Here is a cross-section of the southwest United States where the Grand Canyon is located. Here's the Grand Canyon, and uh, you, when you stand at the Grand Canyon, you see those rock layers on the other side, and they look just like pancakes. And we can trace those rock layers for hundreds, in some cases thousands of miles, and they're just as flat as pancakes. But look at the topography of the southwest United States. We see not only this huge canyon, which is 4 to 18 miles wide and 270 miles long and a mile deep, but we see these other erosional features that look like the ancient shorelines of a huge uh, lake or ocean. But look at those layers in the canyon. We don't see any of those features, which we would expect to see if there was a long passage of time. Now, how long does it take to make fossils? Let's talk about that for a moment. Here's an interesting statement from some evolutionists, no friends of uh, creation or the Bible. They say in a book on dinosaurs, fossilization is a process that can take anything from a few hours to millions of years. 